Of wine, maybe a cup of tea and some chocolates, and, and join me for another. For fuck's sake. Welcome to today's edition of For Fuck's Sake, <laughs> episode two, with my dear non swearing friend, the fabulous <laughs> Julia Fordham. Thank you. <laughs> you know, it's so funny. We're so at ease, we, we know each other so well. Um, just before Matt so cruelly hit the button to start, um, I said, Julia, I wonder if we should have changed clothes. And, and we both <laughs> went, oh, fuck it. Yeah, so she does swear. She does. But, but I feel responsible for that. I feel like I have. I do. I feel like I've actually Well, sometimes I have to talk you. your language to well, understand. Yes, to, to make me understand. I'm yes. like, what, do you, yeah. what? what does she really mean? What? Yeah. She, I think that I've always described the difference. Obviously, you know, I've spent most of my life in London, as have you. But the difference between us, I, sp I suppose, as a Celt and, and an Eng is that I've always seen you as being like very English rose. And I've got mm. that kind of like uh, lusty, what a, whatever it's called, you know, earthy Welshness. And that's the <laughs> difference between us is that, I, yeah, it, Julia's o Julia likes to think the best of everyone. And I have to think the worst because it's the only way I can get through life, really. <laughs> Uh, but that's but also no. our sort of natural disposition, isn't it? You have to be who you are. You have to be who you are. Yeah. But I also know that it has become very important since the day I met you, you and I made each other laugh because yes. of that. Yours was your, your infinite, uh, you know, like kindness and, and, and joy in all around you and people all around you. And my job, I always felt like job, but what I liked <laughs> doing was just being so awful <laughs> or just making you chuckle. It's exactly it. Because she does make me chuckle. With how, uh, yeah, I would just like shit on that <laughs> rainbow. <laughs> Piss on that sparkle. The rainbow shitter. Yeah, I, I am indeed the rainbow shitter. Anyway, back to the story because it was so fantastic. Where we left off last week, um, before we had chocolate yeah, and we nuts had a chocolate and then realised they were in our teeth. <laughs> what a mess. Yeah, but got fresh tea. Fresh more tea. Uh, so where we left it was how Julia Fordham came to be, where she came from, her roots. Then we got to the three Jones. Joni Mitchell, Joan Armour Trading, Ricky Lee Jones, the palette from mm. which you really were inspired and given mm. permission to be all mm. that you wanted and could be and heard in yourself, which is so thrilling. So now I want to know, take it away, Julia. Now from here we go from big school, secondary school, you're working big, in the bigger mix, <laughs> bigger mix. But how did you get to that next place, to London, to the center of, you know, wh where we grew up, to the place wow. where you knew that you would get that deal? I don't know why London felt so difficult, but it just did. I mean, when you're living on Hailing Island, mm. you've got to get over the bridge and, and up there. And one thing that pointed me in that direction was that I'd... I'd already dropped out of college. This had gone down very dismally with my parents. And my sister and I still laugh at my mum's great catch rate, which was, well, you're not going to sit around here writing songs all day. <laughs> <laughs> it's brilliant. You can't make it up. No. And then marched me down to the job centre, you know, where all the L keys and the, and the people who are also just like desperately looking for jobs. So what that did was made me realize that my choices were that I either had a youth opportunity scheme at either IBM, which my mum wanted me to take, because it was something to fall back on. It was in heaven. It was a new like. Oh, I know that one business. very well though. There's something to fall back right. on. Something That's to fall the reason I went and had a degree yeah. for that reason. And yeah. then a job at Useless. Radio Victory. So these both came from the ah. job center. But my mum really tried to talk me out of Radio Victory, but I had it in my head that maybe there just might be someone there who would get me. And um, they, were, they were disappointed because it was going to be quite a trajectory in a business world. Really, you'd have something to fall back on that you'd never get out of it. So I go to Radio Victory following my instinct the first of many times. And those people helped me there so much. And that was a radio, but that was, it was a, ra a radio station. That was music radio, radio Victory yeah? was an independent local radio station and it was there that first of all a producer there noticed that I had a very good speaking voice and he asked me to 
come down to the studio and try out for the commercials because basically they would hire these actresses in and, um, and he was, his name's George East and he was like, right, and the big hand gets up to the 12 there, you've got to start talking, you've got 15 seconds and you've got to go, you've got to start, you've got to end and you've got to get it all in. And the script is something like, if you come down to your local development today, <laughs> you can go down. And it turned out it was a complete natural edit. I just yes. like, like, boom, started like, boom. When the clock finished, I was like, boom. I swear to God, when it finished, he went, I don't suppose you can sing, can you? And I was like, yes, I can. I want to be a singer. And then I started doing jingles. I started, and everyone at Radio Victory helped me because I was able to continue working on my sound and writing my songs and doing my thing. And I also learned from that experience that you had to get your stuff to what was then called an A&R man. Uh -huh. That you had to make a cassette and you had to get it to one. And I also worked, you know, for some other people and did, I mean, I was just working, 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 working like a crazy person to try and pay for the tape. Yeah. So I finally end up, again, Radio Victory, I love you. I met a really amazing young engineer producer there called Bill Padley. Bill had moved to Scotland. We always stayed in touch. He was like a young prodigy. He had his own show, the morning show. He was like 19. And... You know, I, he called me, Jules, what's happening? I've got a studio. Have you still got all those amazing songs? You should come up and demo them. So I go up to his wow. house. It's where I meet Grant Mitchell. And Grant is my musical backbone and really my musical collaborator for most of my work. So at this time, I'm like really you know, tired because I'm having to pay the rent, uh -huh. do the backing singing, do the day jobs and trying to get my tape together. Yeah. But really, Radio Victory was this, not just like a stepping stone, it was like this trampoline yeah. into ev everything. It, I, I learned that I had a good talking voice. I could maybe make that pay because I used to get paid for doing the adverts. Singing jingles was an incredible discipline in the yeah. studio. I haven't been yes. in the studio to sing before. I hadn't been demoing anything. And then Bill gives me his hand and I go and I do six songs and five of those songs are on my first album. So I'm going and doing the rounds, meeting A&R men. You and I have talked about how demoralizing that can be. And some One of the, the things that things are the world. said to you that yeah. you spend a lifetime trying to recover from. But I was finally, I got a publishing deal before I got a record deal but by this point I was like I was just like on the brink I, I just it was like I just ha was working so hard to just meet that monthly rent yeah. and and f you know on that demo was happy ever after my first hit really comfort of strangers where does the time go mm. um my personal you know, favorite invisible war oh which went on to God. be like you know a national anthem for invisible national anthem for the Filipino In the people yeah um behind closed doors I mean uh, I finally got heard, and um, but I was like, I don't know how long I could have kept going uh -huh. at that point. I was I've heard this a lot, though. People, when they're just about ready to throw the towel in, and they yeah. feel like they cannot go another step, and yeah. suddenly... <sighs> And, and then, they're ready to, you know, and they're then it happened. And then it started happening fast. So the publishing, was the pu were the publishers the ones that then got... Well, what happened about the publishing was that People were saying, you never sign your publishing first. Mm. You have to sign it afterwards. Yeah. But by this point, I was just like, I was hungry. Yeah. And I just really liked the publisher. It was a guy called Mark Moreau uh -huh. and um, Paul Rump, Richard Manners. And I just couldn't wait any longer. And I was like, you know, I did that enterprise allowance scheme i had seven grand oh, i did that i know it well and yeah. and i just was like i can't wait to yeah. get the record deal i have to give up this temporary secretary job so that i can fully concentrate what i'm doing again i went with my instinct yep. i then had a manager at this point a woman called jasmine danes and somehow i just how did you meet her I was working a lot, singing a lot, and I had this incredible friend called Angie Giles, who was a phenomenal singer. Oh, yeah. And Angie said that she'd met this woman who was managing someone and maybe they, she would be good. She was the only person I knew who did it. And she then was like, well, okay, I'll start trying to take the tapes around. And she had a few more contacts than me. But actually, I think I'd already gotten into the the Blue Mountain experience. And Blue Mountain was Chris Blackwell's personal company. Yeah. And apparently, Mark Rowe told me that Chris Blackwell heard Happy Ever After, and he said, who's this? Sign her. 
And wow. so I felt like, well, I've heard of Chris Blackwell. I mean, I loved Bob Marley. I would name my daughter Marley, mainly after that, because when you are desperate and on the brink, holding on, you know, like with your fingers about to go down the chalkboard of exhaustion and almost desperation because yeah. you sort of, you know what you have is good, yes. but you're just trying to get it to that next level. So I felt like they heard me and caught me and saved me. And one thing that Blue Mountain did that was very generous. Now I have to say my experience, that once I got into my publishing deal and then my record deal, which I'll get to, my experience was with absolute princes and gentlemen. Now, prior to getting to that, I had some difficult and challenging things that I won't even put any light on being the born person that you were saying, you know, I'm kind of like, I can't go there uh -huh. because these guys were such a gift and they saved me. So very quickly when I was able to just have help in paying the rent, even though it wasn't a very big deal, they wrote something in which was like, if you get a deal, a record deal with like within a year, you can, they would give you what would be considered a decent amount of money. Oh, so they would renegotiate, Yes, basically. they would renegotiate. So to me, I was like, it's a win-win. Oh, win -win. that's almost unheard of. It's unheard of, and it felt gentlemanly to me. And so I just, I did that, and that's exactly what happened. And then I had two labels interested, and I, again, I went with my instincts. I was right about Radio Victory. I was right about the modest deal with Blue Mountain. Mm -hmm. I was right about going with this little brand new label called Circa that had just started out, and they two guys who'd left Island Records and no one had had a hit yet, They'd, but they signed Nena Cherry, mm -hmm. Hue and Cry, mm -hmm. two bands that ended up all at the same time as me. Yeah. But I just intuitively, I knew that um, Ashley Newton and Ray Cooper were my guys because the same thing, they had the same reaction to the demo as Chris Blackwell and Mark Moreau had had. And I just sort of thought, well, these are my guys, because they were like, Ray was like, bloody hell. You know, Ray passed a couple of years ago. I went to his funeral. I just, I have genuine love and affection for my record company. I loved those but guys. But they obviously, the thing that's interesting to me here, because yes, we've all come across the other the types other. of people in the business. But the, it sounds like these guys were absolutely open and... They were open. Open. They were open and honest with their feelings they about the music and you. In me, including when they I'd done the demos with Bill and Grant, and yeah. they wanted to put me with a producer, which we did because that's what you did. And yeah. then when I went to them and said, "Actually, I need you to hear me," my guys, Bill and Grant, are more talented than this guy. They were like, "Okay, yeah, okay, you're right, yeah." And I, I was just like, "And what? they, uh, this is this is so fantastic because it's just like." For, for every one of them, there's, as you know, a yes. hundred others that yes. are like, no, no, you get the no. star producer, that's no. it. No, you have no voice. No. Um, that's a rare and incredible thing. It is. And so when really. they then came back to me at the end of the record and said, we're wondering, do we take three songs and actually get in a named producer like, say, Hugh Padgham? Yeah. I wanted to show them the same respect. Yeah. yeah, maybe you're right, because I don't know everything. I'd started really struggling with my vocals, because by this time, when we were in the studio, I thought that I would sing differently and be differently. I'm like, why am I the same old me? I didn't know hmm. that you, the same old you is what it is. And so even Bill and Grant, we were like, we, we kept thinking we would, it was meant to be better or more. And I just couldn't get there. And having that experience with Hugh Padgham was also absolutely remarkable, because he mirrored to me that actually it's enough. You just have to open your mouth and go, don't ask me why yeah. I'm running out of laughter. It's enough. You don't have to, don't, I, you don't have to do anything. Because I just sort of thought, I was looking for like, ta-da, but I don't do ta-da. No, but I, also, ta-da is, is what's been, is, is the ta-da is the recording. Yes. That's the thing yeah. that, that you forget is like, th there's the, well, any of the magic and the, and the fairy dust is the recording itself, but you are you, and that, that's really it. But that's, that's, that's youth as well, isn't it, really? That's that thing where you yes. think somehow, somehow when you hit, it's going to be like, yeah. Ah! But it's, yeah. it isn't. It is, it's as simple as... And everything was, you know, became very exciting and inspiring. So including, you know, I went to New York to work with Hugh, yeah. and I fell absolutely in love on sight with this guy, this m gorgeous man. And while I was there, like literally fin finishing the first album, I was I wrote half the songs on the second album. Yeah. So I did not have the usual trajectory where people do that first album cycle and then they're fishing for the 
second album and need time. I was electrified and charged. You're elated by yeah, it. Yeah, because and really Blue Mountain, yeah. they supported me. They helped me stop having to get up at dawn and, you know, be a temporary secretary all day. And so when I was not indulged, but rather afforded the opportunity, which well, I saw that's, as a... Well, that's nurturing, but that's also what's yes. what labels used to do mm. when they, you know, they, they invested in their artists. That was the whole point of it. Now, of course, it's difficult because, of course, everything that you are being given, you then have to pay back. Ah, that and, is the um, horror of it. But I was very clear. I knew how it worked. I'd yeah. had it explained. I had a lovely lawyer, Andy Stinson. He'd explained it. I was very clear how it worked. But I liked my people. I liked my team. I liked it when we went with Comfort of Strangers and it didn't go how we thought. And they said to me, oh, sorry about that. You were right. We should have done Happy Ever After. Yeah. Let's do a video for that now. Yeah. So I felt like I was very respected and supported. And then Happy Ever After totally connected yeah. and went to number one in Japan. And then my life just went on that fast track where you're suddenly, you know, flying around and you're on television shows and the morning show and people are interested in you and your voice and your songs and exciting things are happening. And but I, it, it, there's the word there that's important to me is respected. Yeah. I think that is such a rare and wonderful thing. Mm. I mean, I don't get the feeling, and tell me if I'm wrong, but I get the feeling that you were very much also you, visually the way you looked and the way that you presented yourself was that was you. They were really great about all of those things. Yeah. Like we tried some things. I was like, I don't know if that's really me. And then, yeah. you know, they, they were, I, I had a good eye. And they had a really good team, yes, Michael but you, Nash but Associates, and they listened all the time. Yeah. Even down to when we chose the upside down cover yes. for Happy Ever After. Yes. I felt that my voice was always heard. Yeah. And um, the same with Porcelain. Um, I will still meet people to this day who with tell red me coat. they bought that album cover because of that album yeah. That red velvet coat and the picture and and I was and, and Ashley and Ray they were not a tough sell. I was like, we were right about upside down. Let's look at this photo and I think we should go with this on the front. They were like, yeah, you're right. You're really well, sure. and that again, so mm. rare. Yes, makes me happy to hear you say this. My <laughs> my experiences were slightly different, but uh, ultimately, I think most people's work. most are. And I think what's amazing about it is that you are somebody with a great eye. You always have. You 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 really do micromanage all your covers, all mm. your artwork, because you have a clear idea as to the mm. visual that goes with the well, tone of the music. The reason, again, like what we had done a beautiful, the Happy Ever After video was beautiful. It got on VH1 yeah. in America, and it opened that door for me. So I'm now in a, I'm in a visual world. Yeah, and. I saw this beautiful red coat. It was uh, by a designer called Megan Douglas. I'd seen it somewhere. Yeah. And I just became obsessed. But by that time, Ashley and Ray at Circuit Records were supporting me. And, I, yeah. and even down, there was a beautiful video for Lock and Key, which that we recorded in the south of France where I was making yeah. the porcelain record. This was the most exhilarating and productive time of my life yeah. because I was in love, I was charged, I had, you know, these great songs and really the, the first three albums, even on like with the third album swept again in the American record company, I was there doing something I can't even remember what. And this was what changed that third album for me was I had finished whatever we were doing in America, I wanted to come home. And I got one of those phone calls. It was like, could you literally right now, the second, go and meet with Peter Asher because Linda Ronstadt was going to write, going to sing the song that's been written for a movie. The movie's called The Butcher's Wife. It's yeah. the follow-up to the Demi Moore ghost movie. Yeah. She's not going to sing it. She can't sing it. She wasn't well. She was Whatever it was, it was like, yesterday Linda was doing it. Tomorrow she's not. Mm -hmm. So I suddenly had this incredible experience with talking to Peter Asher, who you know from the Christmas shows, who is like this really the most brilliant human. He's so eccentric, he's so talented. Have you ever met anyone who was like, you know, a child star, you know, amazing producer, manager, work for a record he, company? He's, like, he's pretty extraordinary. He's, he's extraordinary. Yeah, he and I had this exhilarating conversation with him. And again, and being an English person, I was like, oh, I want to go home so badly, Peter. And he yeah. was like, Darling, don't do it. Don't do it. Get in the car right now. Come to the, come and meet me. We've got to do this song. You can have any band you want. Who do you want on drums? I said, Vinnie Caliuto. He said, done. Who do you want on bass? I was like, Larry Klein. He was like, mm. I can make it happen. And so something about that third album, again, it was 
right at the last minute, it was elevated because of singing a song, which I wasn't that open to because I like to write my own songs. But again, it presented itself. I, that's how I move in the world. Sometimes life says yes. And I realized it was saying yes, even though yes. my body was saying, no, I want to go home. Life just said yes. Go to this session, sing this song. Love moves in mysterious, mysterious way. ways. Yeah. And that went on to be a huge hit in the Philippines. And, you know, I got to be in a beautiful video with the actual Demi Moore, who's a goddess. You know, my face is like merging with hers. Fantastic. And it introduced me to Larry Klein. I was going to say, was, now that, because I didn't know that. Yeah. This is going to be my, my big questions is, how the fact did you meet Larry? How did that come about? Well, I so actually had met Larry at, so I've done my first albums primarily with Grant Mitchell. And a bit of Hugh Padgham, a yeah. bit of Graham Dixon, a bit of Bill Padley. But really... Grant, amazing pianist, mm. arranger, producer, as you know. He's so, uh, and just, just, just as an aside, because we could do a whole, a whole episode on Grant. He truly is one of the most incredible, tasteful, and inspiring uh, musicians I've ever come across. No, he is. He's brilliant. His, he, uh, no, yeah. his pianist, his playing. He's just remi he's, it's, just, it's he's the humble genius, isn't he? Really? He is the humble genius. One yeah. of my favorite things, as a quick aside, I have to say, is when you and he are just, you know, as a uh, as a duet, it, it blows mm. my mind because it is so it is such a pure thing of just your you know lush and luxurious voice with his astounding piano playing and uh, and, and it always moves me to my core. Mm, but we'll get back you. to a bit more a um, bit more of Grant in a bit. So you had done. Those I met Klein actually before this session at the Living Goddess. <laughs> Joni Mitchell <laughs> had been at um, an art gallery talking about her art. And I somehow got to meet her. Where was the gallery? It was somewhere in London. Oh, God. And got I it. remember Sam Brown was there. And I was there with my mate Angie, who I mentioned last week. She was there with her friend, who's another amazing singer-songwriter. And um, we all were gagging to meet Joni. But we just couldn't. She was, like, surrounded by people. We just couldn't get to her. And she was just so swamped by people. I thought, you know what? I'm going to... I'm going to step down. I just can't be like one yeah. more person trying to go, Joni, yeah. I love you. Yeah. And, and I just was teary-eyed looking at her, surrounded by her, her artwork. And I'm like, I'm close to her. It's enough. It's enough. It's enough. And literally, she's in this moment where she's, you know, with all these people. Then she suddenly just turns around and she walks and she stops right in front of me. She stops and she looks me up and down and as if to say, hello, and who are you? She didn't say anything. And I said, Again, life has just presented Joni Mitchell right in front of you. So I say, oh, my God, Joni, I, I'm such a huge fan. I, I'm also a singer-songwriter, but, you know, you're the biggest influence. I, I just think you're the most incredible singer-songwriter. My name is Julia Fordham. I was about to say, and I did say, it's my friend, Angie Giles. And she went, Julia Fordham, Larry loves you. My husband, Larry Klein, he loves you. Come with me. And then she took me by the wrist, not the hand, by the wrist, and, f and took me over to the the red velvet rope area, you know, like the yeah. roped-off section. Yeah, and yeah. I remember kind of like leaning back and like grabbing Angie with my other hand. Everything went into slow motion and I grabbed Angie and Angie came with me and it was like... <laughs> and then she <laughs> takes me to the, the, the exclusive people's area. And me and Angie are standing there and then she says to Klein, Klein, it's that girl you love. And Klein goes, oh, my God, Julia Forum, I love the porcelain record. And we start talking, and Klein is so kind and gracious. And he says that, you know, he'd love to work with me. <gasps> and he's saying all these things. Oh. And then we get to talk to Joni, and, and I have this, like, incredible bond with, with, with Larry. And, you know, I can honestly say, that I, when I first heard the Wild Things Run Fast... And, you know, there's there's some bass playing that Klein does that I nearly fainted when I first heard it. That is the first record of hers I ever really? heard. This You're blowing my mind now. Spooky. That's the first... I came late to Joni, you see, very late. That was the first one. And and Larry's bass playing was like, I what, was like what in God's yeah. and name? You, I mean, that record was With brilliant. that octopedal thing oh he was playing, it's just like, bestill my heart and my ovaries. Exactly. Unbelievable. I was, I was like weak at the knees yeah. at the sound of Klein. Yeah. So I didn't know what he looked like. I didn't know anything about him. I didn't know he was married to Joni. Or I, and then uh, some other musicians were saying, and I remember that it's only English guys could go. Some people go, oh, fuck it, oh, he's fucking good, isn't he? Yeah, fucker. 
<laughs> he's fucking married to her. What a fucker. And yeah. then everyone was talking in those swearing English terms about how brilliant Klein was yeah. and how incredible Joni was. And I was just like flabbergasted. So to be actually, for Joni to say this thing and to be talking to Klein and meanwhile to go. What well, a moment. It was this like moment to the point that the next morning, I couldn't quite believe any of it had happened, including Klein going, you know, Joni Klein going, oh, you should come to the house, you should make a record, you should do this, you should do that. And I remember thinking, this guy can't be true. And I remember ringing Ange, and uh, we used to live together, but I'd moved into my own apartment. And I remember Ange going, I know, I know, mate, I know. I said, but did it happen? We actually weren't sure. We could, we, it was so surreal and so incredible that we, if either one of us hadn't have been there, we would have thought we'd dreamt the whole thing. And then to then quickly, shortly thereafter, I guess I'm on the third album at this point, and like, who do you want to work with? Larry Klein on bass. And I'm in a studio setting with Klein. And then I remembered telling my lovely guys at the record company about this thing with Klein. They're going, bloody hell, really? Are you sure? And I'm like, I think it happened. Yes, I think they said, come to the house. And, and of course, it happened. And wow. I remember Klein saying he wanted to, to send me something he just worked on. Sean Colvin's album. Oh my God. And I remember putting on that CD and that opening the Polaroids and Klein's bass and Sean singing that. And that whole record to me just faultless and so distinctive for what he's doing with Joni. Yeah. And I'm just kind of like, and I remember again, the my lovely guys at record come down, you're gonna have to go and live there. You're gonna have to get on a plane and go. And and, and I'm like, I can do it. And, and uh, you know, uh, the wow. other godmother, Susanna, who we were talking about last week, I actually moved in with her and I started my record at Joni Mitchell's house with Klein on my fourth album, Falling Forward. So my, for me, those first four albums, that whole moment in time, it was gold. It was just absolutely gold, like creatively, musically, lifestyle-wise. You know, I now like owned a, an apartment. You know, I'd gone from living in assisted living, basically, to just like no longer like scrambling and being at the top of my game. So really, those four albums for me, the first four albums, and also it was hard to break away from Grant. I'm very much merged musically from Grant. So sort of separating and then coming to America, which actually yeah. even looking back, it was hard. It was hard, like trying to drive here and live here. And it's be hard here. when you first come here, even though even if yes. it's been a dream and you're getting to, you know, to be yes. with Larry Klein and Joni Mitchell, it's still really hard to be away from the place that is your home yes. where you feel that yeah. you know you feel safe and the people that you love. And of course, speaking of Susanna, uh, this is what's so bizarre in life and why I do believe that there's sometimes there's just like there are these cycles, you know, yeah. there these rings where we all go around and meet the same people and meet, yeah. meet each other. I remember um, hearing you and um, watching you on TV and sort of like, oh, I like her. And, uh, and you know, being a fan, you cut to me coming to America and same said, my, you know, my competitive godmother, uh, <laughs> Susanna Young, <laughs> saying to me, She's uh, and from New Zealand. Dude, she, she'd come. To, uh, somehow I'd got to her. I'd made uh, I'd made a, an album uh, with a producer called Julie Last. She worked a lot with uh, Larry Klein. Larry right. Klein came in and played bass on it. And I thought I died and gone to heaven. That was beyond fathoming for me. I couldn't. Mm. It was the first album I ever made. It was here, and and Sue came over to give me a massage. She was a great masseuse, mm. and she said. Have you ever heard of uh, <laughs> Judy Fordman? <laughs> and I said, oh, I love her. She's fantastic. She says, oh, you, you so remind me of her. She's just, there's something about you. And um, and bugger me, um, unbeknownst to me, you were living on the other side of the road. But also what's really interesting about sometimes like the <sighs> force of life, like Larry Klein in the same week as Susanna said to you and Susanna also said to me, he said, you know this girl, Judith Owen? <laughs> And he said to me, you come from the same place. You look alike. You sound alike. So you must come from the same place in England, he said. And I think you two should meet. And then Sue said it. I was, I was like, this is really bizarre. And then I'm staying at Simon Climey. Simon Climey, hit songwriter from yeah. Climey Fisher, who I'm also just written a couple of songs with. So I'm having this really different experience with working with Larry Klein and Simon Climey. And where are you? But standing outside Simon Climey's apartment and... There you are, this person, and suddenly my isolated yeah. in America, other than Susanna, who is the, the gift to all people. She is the gift to all people. But I also, then I meet you, this fast-talking, brilliant, hilarious British person, and we're like, 
a match instantly. And I think that was the point. And I didn't realize that you were feeling the same way. Isn't that how strange the universe mm. is? I was lonely and alone and I'd just come here mm. and I had no friends and I felt like a fish out of water and I was desperately homesick. Yeah. And it was that interesting, amazing thing where it was like, and also I think Larry Klein's description of us, he was right. We do sound the same. We do have come from a similar yeah. path. And yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, that that time was just amazing. It, yeah, I'm I'm forever grateful for that. Well, look, we, now we've got to how you got to America. Yeah. There's a third episode now that's coming, which is going to be from America onwards. <laughs> and then the fourth will be back to Britain. People How's that? Like, Could th we this please is have someone else on oh, the same No, 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 no. <laughs> this is marvelous. I might just have to put, I might just go back to putting one out on Wednesday and one on Sunday. It's so good. So uh, episode three, America. <laughs> And the, uh, as we call each other, the, the mighty mungs finally uh, collaborate. Well, when we first met, we both knew all the same comedy sketches, including verbatim, Judith <laughs> knew, the smashy and nicey sketch most mungus made. Most and, like, mungus to meet made. somebody who knew that and could immediately... Harry Enfield and Paul uh, yeah. Whitehouse doing and this terrible for Americans wretched BBC radio uh, <laughs> DJs who were just talking the sort of transatlantic voice, you know, like most mongers made. I'm doing it for charity, mate. <laughs> All that shit. And so the two of us were just so happy to speak the same language. Yeah. We became the mongers. And the it most has been mates. most mongers mate. It has been ever since. But yeah, and then another, a lifetime then from that point onwards, which we shall learn all about on the next episode. Thank you again well, thank you. for joining me. Join me next Sunday for episode three <laughs> of the fabulous <laughs> behind the scenes story of Julia Fordham. Wonderful artist that you are. Thank you for spending a little bit of your Sunday with me. I have been your hostess with the mostest love of even more factoids about <laughs> Julia Fordham than I even thought possible, my most mongous mate. I give you a right royal for fuck's sake. Take care of yourselves. I'll see you next week. Love you guys. Mwah.